Welcome along to another Sky F1 podcast. I'm very pleased to say with me today, I have Martin Brundle, Anthony Davidson and Craig Slater. We have a lot to get through today. Much has happened in the world of Formula One, not least a calendar for 2020, and we will be going racing in a month's time. But first, we have an exclusive interview with Toto Wolff. We haven't heard much from many of the team principals during this lockdown, but he sat down earlier with Martin Brundle to talk all things F1. Thanks for joining us, Toto. Welcome to the show. Lots of Formula One activity going on at the moment, including facts and rumours. We'll get straight into those. Formula One restarting, eight race calendar so far announced. Are you happy with the way that F1 is re-engaging? And what's the status at the team in their preparedness for the season ahead? Hi, Martin. Um, yes, I'm happy with um, how Formula One has come up with a calendar. At least we know uh, that we're going back to racing for the next few months. Uh, it's a solid European calendar and everybody back in Brackley and Brixworth is happy that we can get finally uh, back on the track. We, we love the competition and um, we, were, we, we missed that. How many races are you anticipating uh, for, for the season up until Christmas, let's say? So we know uh, the, the European calendar looks pretty solid. I think the two Middle Eastern races at the end um, um, seem to be okay. And then it's about filling the big gap in autumn. So I would hope that we could have 12 um, or more races as a minimum. So we're straight into eight races in 10 weeks. Is that a particular challenge logistically, maybe for spare parts, engines uh, and what have you? Yeah, it is a challenge because uh, we are all aware why that, why that is, but I think we, we owe it um, to our fans um, to um, give them racing and uh, come up with a good show. And of course, logistically, it will be heavy for all of us doing triple headers, not being able to, to go home, um, but it's these special circumstances. If we do have, say, a 12 to 15 race season instead of the 22 that were anticipated do you think that's a good thing for Mercedes does it help you or does it hinder you as a team I think at that stage we're not looking at performance we are foremost happy that we are going back to racing um, so many months have passed since February testing I think the team that will get up to speed quickest in a reliable way is going to be successful on track. So at the moment, I think it's about consolidating the package that we know from the winter and then making the best out of it. I think uh, uh, DNFs uh, um, around reliability are going to be a key, a key part of this year's championship. Of course, in testing, you had the dual axis steering and you, know, you showed very good pace, it must be said. During the lockdown, have you been able to make any improvements to the car or, or the power unit or has it literally all been shut down and you're going to have to race whatever you had back at the February tests? No, it was a real lockdown um, and, and therefore there we agreed, all teams agreed on the shutdown and the time is very limited to actually work on the cars. We, we barely have five weeks where we can do something. Um, of course, we will try to improve, maybe bring an upgrade um, that would have been planned anyway for that time of the year. But it's going to be more a, a live um, testing um, experience rather than running it in previous races in, um, in free practice sessions. So very exciting, very new, a curveball that is thrown at all of us and uh, may the best man win. And of course, we're starting in your home country of Austria, which must give you a bit of extra pleasure. Yeah, it will give, we, we'll give you guys extra pleasure. Austria is a wonderful country. Uh, everything is open here. You will enjoy the Styrian mountains. I'm going to take you out for a bike ride. <laughs> if we're allowed to go out for a bike ride, of course. But So uh, at least Austria and, and Great Britain look as if they're double headers. And a lot of talk of the, at the second race, maybe changing the format. So we, we could introduce something a little bit different for the following weekend and activate some extra track running Friday and Saturday. Uh, you reportedly, or the Mercedes team, were not uh, happy with this, would not sign up to it. Why, why was that? Uh, very simple. It's three main reasons. First of all, uh, you know, we, we seem to be digging out old um, ideas uh, that have been diligently analyzed and have been rejected um, for some good reasons. And one of those reasons is that we know it from touring car race, racing that strategy games um, are uh, the name of the game. And if you know that you're not in a 
great position on on on, a, on the weekend before you may decide to dnf a car you and and start the next weekend on pole and there may be teams that will be using that for an advantage uh, and the same you can do whilst in the race um, midfield cars will fight heavy for position as they should um, so for the top teams coming from behind it will mean taking more risks in overtaking and that could mean um, making this championship a bit of a lottery so this is the number one reason the number two reason is um, we lo simply love the meritocracy of formula one best man and best machine wins and I think a lot of fans have expressed that same view. I think only 15% uh, in an F1 survey supported the reverse grid. So we are um, real racists. We think um, this is not, it, it, Formula One doesn't need a show format uh, like wrestling and um, the DNA is important. And um, the third reason is, is simply that uh, uh, we have a championship to play. Um, we believe we have a good car, and this is the, the more um, inward-looking uh, reason. And, um, of course, for second and third place team, it's an advantage to start in front. And uh, Formula One is a, a tough business, and you're not here to make, um, to make any gifts. Uh, back on uh, February the 12th, we had a fascinating interview, uh, along with yourself and Lewis, talking about your relationship and, and the future. Has anything happened uh, contract-wise? Have you signed Lewis up? Anything moved forward? Seems like a lifetime ago now. Seems like a lifetime ago. Um, yes, we have uh, uh, not signed a contract. We, we're talking to each other or, or we are keeping in contact uh, regularly. We have been in different parts of the world, but very much um, keep ourselves in the loop of what is, what is happening. And um, the moment Lewis touches down back in Europe, we will sit down and, and uh, carve out um, what needs to be carved out. We, we are together since, I believe it's eight years now, so the agreements don't need to be reinvented. There's a good basis, and I believe uh, we could come to a point pretty, pretty swiftly. Isn't Lewis leaving himself out in the cold a little bit at the moment with everybody else settled down? This is June already, for goodness sake. No, if you trust, and I think our relationship is based on trust, um, you know that the par your partner is not going to let you down. Uh, we all, of course, are aware that Formula One is a tough business, but I think what made this team different is that uh, loyalty, trust, um, and trust are important values, and we live them every day. Sebastian Vettel has announced he's leaving Ferrari in, for 2021, which is scarily close now. Uh, is he on your radar? Would you be interested to take him on at Mercedes-Benz, a German driver in a German car? I said it before, Sebastian is a four-time world champion and um, him suddenly becoming available was uh, unexpected. And therefore, it is a, um, a situation that needs to be uh, monitored. Where could he potentially go? Uh, where are we with our drivers? And what I said is that I wouldn't discount Sebastian for any seat. And, um, and we have looked at the situation. We, our priority and concentration is on our Mercedes drivers. That's Lewis Valtteri and the juniors, um, George Russell being one of them. Esteban obviously is a Renault driver today. And only if we can't find a solution uh, within that group of drivers, we will look um, elsewhere. And then obviously Sebastian is in a, in a very good position. Okay, so that's clear. You, you're going to take from within first. And if not, you'll, you'll talk to Sebastian some more. Yep. Some more, or uh, maybe even open up the conversation with him. Yeah, you, you, as you say, you've got Valtteri doing a great job. Young George there at Williams and Esteban on presumably some kind of piece of elastic. So you're spoiled for talent now. Yeah, but we must not be, um, um, how can I say, complacent because um, Red Bull has two very talented drivers. I think Ferrari um, have two very talented drivers. I think the combination they've chosen is, is very good. And uh, we need to make sure that our short-term future is in good hands. And there, is, there are no better hands out there than Lewis's hands. And then our mid to long-term um, um, strategy is being considered. And, and therefore, it's not, an, it's not an easy situation, but I believe we are in a, in a good place. I can't believe you're particularly happy with it, but the new $145 million budget, plus, 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 it must be said, that starts up next year is in place, signed off. 
Can you live with it? Can you cope with it, Mercedes Benz? And what do you really honestly feel about the budget caps? Well, I believe that we live in the same financial reality and we, the coronavirus has impacted us more than any other crisis before. And um, um, the teams accepting a budget cap was a necessity. Not only our parent um, is uh, trying to reduce costs and become more efficient, but the same should be, should be valid for us as race teams. It is an anomaly in any business world and sporting world that a top team is not um, able to have a break-even result or even post some profits. And with the cost cap, certainly challenges are thrown at us. We need to uh, change the way we, we do things. But I believe overall it is a long-term insurance policy that Formula One continues to prosper and that the teams continue to prosper. And certainly for us as big teams who, who, who have a good group of partners and, um, and, a, and a solid structure, we believe we can turn it into profit, profitability and therefore make it an easy call for any shareholder such as Daimler to say, well, we're in this for a long time. Uh, do you personally think it can help the racing or, or hurt F1 racing by coming down on the budgets? No, I think definitely will help the racing because the big teams need to come down on the budgets and uh, uh, this means restructuring um, uh, the process, um, simplifying things and uh, some of the smaller teams, having said that, I think that some have realized that they are probably close to the budget cap anyway or above. Um, you look at McLaren, they have been the, the, at the forefront of fighting for 100 million cap and now it's been announced that they, there is, um, even within the F1 team, people are being made redundant. So it is a tough situation for, for the big ones, but I believe it will compress the field in terms of performance. Uh, we will have more variability in the results um, rather than just having three teams able to win. There will be four or five that will be able to win and, and others to, able to go on the podium. So I think I welcome the cost cap as much as of a challenge it will be, but I think it's a necessity today. I'm loving the sound of four or five teams capable of winning. Let's hit some rumours head on. Toto Wolff's leaving Mercedes-Benz, going to Aston Martin. You bought a share, uh, some shares in Aston Martin. Mercedes are pulling out of Formula One. What can you tell us? Well, I think it's all nonsense. Um, but I un understand that in a time where there is no racing, um, the headlines have to be made. Yes, I, I bought a few shares in Aston Martin. I believe in the long-term strategy of the car brand uh, and, and the way it's being deployed. And this is a portfolio diversification for me. It's a financial investment. I'm not going to play any executive um, role there. It's in the capable hands of Tobias, who I've known for a long time, and obviously Lawrence um, as a chairman behind. And um, I am happy where I am. Mercedes is my family. I really enjoy the relationship I have within the racing group, but also within, within the Daimler group. Contrary to what is being said outside, um, I'm very close to Ola Kalenius. We speak every, almost every week and um, are very, very much aligned. So I'm not planning to go anywhere else. It's our intention to come to a situation where we can announce some kind of agreement, but it's more complex because it's not only, I'm not only an employee um, as a team principal, but there is a shareholding structure behind and all that needs time. Uh, finally, and I'm very jealous, you've got such a smart haircut over there in Austria. We don't have that privilege in the UK at the moment, but how much have you missed Formula One and how much are you looking forward to getting back in early July? It's a good question because when we went racing in Australia, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, look forward to it because I had six um, so intense seasons uh, in fighting for world championships that um, the mental exhaustion was still there. And um, when it got cancelled, obviously, it, it, we didn't know what, what, what happened. And I'm very happy now because we were starved uh, of uh, Formula One and I'm very much looking forward to go back to racing. And, you know, in a way, sadly, there will be not a lot of fans and not a lot of media, but be, it's being reduced to what I love the most, and that is the competition. As always, Toto, thanks for your honesty and your insight. See you soon. Thank you, Martin. So lots for us to discuss there. I'm going to start with you, Martin, first. What's your initial reaction to that chat you had today? Was there one thing that stood out for you from the chat? Toto, very motivated to get up and go racing again. Surprising that he said 
he wasn't that motivated when he went to Melbourne earlier on in the year, a little bit burned out. Um, but I guess my big takeaway is he wants Lewis Hamilton in the team, of course, who wouldn't? Uh, and uh, he'll only really engage Sebastian Vettel uh, if he's exhausted all of the other options he's already got within the team in terms of young drivers and Valtteri Bottas, of course, um, whilst acknowledging that Vettel's a, a great champion and he, he can't dismiss the idea. So uh, that, that, that was my takeaway on, on, uh, um, on the many things that Toto had to say to us today. Yes, he said as soon as Lewis can get back to Europe and they can sit down, they're hoping to get all this sorted out. Um, Anthony, from the purpose of Mercedes, I mean, he, he says, and I think he said in the press briefing later, I think Craig's going to touch on that in a moment, but he said in the press briefing later, I'm not going to ignore the fact Sebastian Vettel is available. It would be rude to ignore that fact. He's a four-time world champion. But our priorities are within the team. We're looking to the medium to long-term solution. And that, you would assume, would mean a younger driver from their programme. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that he, although he acknowledges the fact that Sebastian is available, he's very much in line with their young driver program. Um, he was keen to mention George Russell pretty quickly, uh, who's been doing a fantastic job, uh, but hasn't necessarily always been in the limelight. Um, and I personally feel he deserves that chance to show what he can do you know, with a spotlight on him. Um, and I feel like they're more excited by that option as well um so yeah very interesting that he had even mentioned Ocon uh, who's driving for Renault of course this year um uh to you know even before Sebastian Vettel so I'm sure many people will be surprised maybe even disappointed by uh, that that outlook but teams have a young driver program in place for a reason um you don't build this whole ecosystem within your team to just simply ignore it um, so yeah, it, it's for me it's interesting that they're just purely looking first and foremost at the drivers that they have. It's also interesting when he talked about the short-term future. He said the short-term future is in good hands with Lewis. It's in good hands. But do you get a feeling that there's a place for Valtteri still in the team next year, Martin? From what he was saying. Yes, I do. I, I think Valtteri Bottas. I feel a bit sorry for him actually. He's done a, a very solid job, and it's a constant story is you know who's going to take over from Valtteri Bottas must be a misery trying to operate under that those sort of conditions that cloud if you like um uh, you know he would have won the world championship if Lewis uh, hadn't have been there um has he won as many races as he should have when Lewis was having an off day or problems no not really um would you want to put uh, Vettel and Hamilton in the same team take a bit of controlling you'd have to consider it but um yeah, I, I think, uh, understandably, we pushed, uh, we pushed Toto very hard uh, with direct questions. And what I respect is he doesn't go, look, you can't expect me to answer, you know, uh, contractual issues like that. He didn't bat us away. He's very open about that. And uh, I think it does leave him exposed to a load more questions. But I, I respect the way he does it. And as, as Ant said, why would you have a young driver programme? But you could angle that same question at Ferrari. They, of course, didn't put Giovinazzi in the car. They put Carlos Sainz in the car for next year. So um, there are only 20 seats on the grid. And it's really hard to, to get in one and, and to stay in one. So we're, let, let, let's wait and see. But Valtteri's got as good a chance as anybody. But um, once again, he's got to perform. And Craig... We know that Lewis's contract and the situation, the seats may be available at Mercedes have been much in the news, but Toto's contract himself and his position has been in the news and he looked to clarify that today with everyone. Yes, to me that was the most interesting uh, uh, portion of the, of the news conference. The Ocon thing, just picking up on that, was mentioned to Martin but not in front of the journalists of which I was one at the, the main news conference today. So that was an interesting little snippet. I suppose just to pick up on what the other guys are saying as well. These, these driver programmes cost an awful lot of money. It's Toto that's signing the checks. Ferrari have promoted Leclerc. Red Bull have been doing this kind of thing for years. You've got to have something to show for all this money they're investing. But, but back to... Uh, Toto Wolf. Lots of rumours swirling around, some of which Martin addressed in his interview there. Rumours that he was going to quit the team. Rumours that he was going to buy the team, uh, the Mercedes Formula One team, uh, along with Lawrence Stroll as well, and take it over. Significant chats in Formula One circles that he wasn't getting on with the new CEO. 
at Daimler, Ola Kalenius. Um, he addressed that directly, saying that he and Kalenius uh, got on very well. They had an excellent working relationship. They were on the phone nearly every day. They were good sparring partners for each other. Uh, and, and that, yes, they, they, they could find a way to work together. What was interesting is it was as though Toto was gesturing towards a modified role for himself. He is team principal at the moment. Uh, he's talked about how during this lockdown period, perhaps his attitude to life has changed just a little bit. And you wonder whether he's seeking more of an executive position, perhaps, which means he doesn't have to attend all the races, which gives him time to look at some of his business commitments as well. And he's had that investment uh, in Aston Martin. This is a man worth perhaps in excess of 400 million pounds. Uh, you wonder whether further success in the business arena might want him to take just a little bit of a back seat in, in the sporting arena as well. But what he did say was that in one form or another, and the final wording of, of what his new contract would be like, and indeed the, what his title would be, might still be under discussion, that he did see his future in the short to medium term, at least, still at Mercedes, which will be reassuring for Lewis Hamilton, of course. Definitely. Um, let's move on to one of the other topics that, that's got a lot of attention. And this is this reverse grid idea. Two races at the same track in Austria. How can we keep the entertainment up for the second weekend? How do we mix it up? Um, and the reverse grid idea of using the championship position for that second race for the top 10, say, the teams in general seem to be in favour. Toto against it. And he gave three very clear reasons there, Martin, for it. What did you make of, of the answer to that? And, and do you think that'll satisfy people who want to see this reverse grid? I mean, if Mercedes uh, agreed to mix up the pack and take more risks, it'd be like a turkey voting for Christmas, wouldn't it? Why would they do that? And it needs unanimity to go through at the moment on that particular kind of subject or topic. Um, I would like to see something. I think it's the ideal time. We, I, I don't want to downplay anything. It's still a world championship, even if we only have 12 races, you know, Senna and Schumacher were uh, highly, re remain highly regarded champions with just 15 in the season or, and, and Clark and Hill and Stewart with 10 races in the season. So let, I don't want to dismiss it and go, well, let's have a bit of a play around with this half season. But it does seem with the back-to-back -back races, I don't want to see any cut and paste action where the second race looks very much like the first and why go out on a Friday, for example, or a Saturday morning for the second race, save your motors, save, save your bits and save your parts of your car. Um, so I think there, there is an opportunity to do something. I wouldn't mind seeing a, a reverse grid qualifying race, 45 minutes. You'd have to have a mechanism in the first race to stop people, maybe the cutoff points, 10 laps to go, to stop people just fading away at the end for a better grid slot gives the smaller teams a chance out front for a while in the in the spotlight on the TV, which would help them enormously. I think the same cars would still win the race. Um, and I would love to see Lewis coming through a qualifying race, through a Grand Prix, and take a, a well-earned victory, not by a lap, but by a few seconds. Completely get their point that, yeah, fine, we can come through the pack, but when we get to the second or third teams uh, in the championship, that's where we're going to stall out. And I, and I understand that. But I still think the best team and the best driver would win the world championship. Yeah, I totally agree, Martin. I think the thing that makes me sad, though, is that the only reason why we relish the opportunity to see cars coming through from the back of the grid is because it's too obvious of the result. Um, and all of these things that come along in Formula One, say like DRS, for example, it's a band-aid for the situation. You know, the root cause of the problem is there are only three teams that dominate. Quite often, just one of them is dominating. Um, and nobody wants to see that. So, therefore, a quick fix is to throw those cars at the back of the grid and maybe have a fun watching them come through, perhaps. Um, and that's the thing that makes me sad. So the root of the problem isn't getting solved. And hopefully, going forward, in the next few years with the rule changes, with the budget caps like Toto talked about, hopefully that helps to squeeze the grid in slightly more and give a genuine chance to teams that don't often have a chance to win races or even challenge to win races, um, you know, that opportunity. So I see where he's coming from. Uh, I, you know, I'm a purist. I want to see the fastest car and the best drivers win the race um, and qualify first. I think 
seeing how hard they work in the factories um, and being part of that as well um, from the simulated development program um, you see how hard they work to get those two cars to be the fastest um, to have that taken away from you to then have jeopardy uh, from starting at the back of the grid I totally understand why um, why they wouldn't really be for that um, but like I say the sad thing is is that the root of the problem is there um, in the only one or two three teams dominate yeah total to be fair to what you've just said and uh, backed up your kind of more surgical approach if you like he he talked uh, in a praiseworthy terms about this notion of having this the sliding scale of wind tunnel time which is going to be introduced in reverse grid uh, reverse championship order so that teams have, that have done worse the year before get a bit more time to refine their product he thought that was a, a more f1 type of approach he described the uh, reverse championship grid uh, race proposal as like taking a baseball bat to f1 but maybe in a season which is already slightly compromised with fewer races you, you the authenticity of the championship you don't want it taking another hit or introducing something like that, perhaps. But but the fans can't see the wind tunnels. We're not allowed to see the wind tunnels, Craig, as journalists. So, you know, the fans can see the racing. I'd love to the fans see have against the, Lewis uh, making uh, his way through the field. It would be brilliant. I'd, I you'd have to watch that. It would be must watch for the second weekend. I'll never argue with you, Martin, but I haven't seen a fan <laughs> survey yet which is in favour of these reverse grid sprint races. That's a fair Interestingly, comment. actually, the fans that, uh, that Toto was talking about in that survey did vote very much against the idea of it. However, there is a feeling that that is changing and some current polls are suggesting that maybe because of the situation we've had with all these months without any racing, we've got a shortened calendar and we will be at the same venue twice. Fan feeling is turning in the other direction at the moment. So it'd be interesting to see in the latest polls exactly where that is. And you can almost understand it, Martin, can't you? Why they would want there to be something different on that second weekend. I, I can in a way, but I think our job is to entertain the fans and come up with the programme. Um, we, we shouldn't have to keep asking them what should we be doing next. Let, let's, let's bring them some, something that's compelling. Uh, I, I do get it. Formula One is about excellence. It's not about lowest common denominator, as Ant was pointing out. But, you know, you've got 2020 cricket. You've got other formats in sports that have, that have energised it. And I don't think we should close our mind to it just because, you know, if you spend all weekend sorting out who's the fastest and who's the slowest, and then line them up on the grid in that order uh, with the fastest at the front. Don't be that surprised. There's not too many, too much overtaking, you know? So, but yeah, do I want to just, uh, I don't want to start throwing ballast on them, uh, I, but I, I wouldn't mind a tweak of the format. We've got double headers in Austria, in Silverson, maybe Bahrain and places like that. So it does seem a golden opportunity to introduce something a little bit edgy and exciting but i i do you know i, I i'm a purist as well but uh, i i think it i think there's i think there's something here that we should keep exploring that's my position i am um, i don't on that note, subject, actually, you mentioned those double headers. We have got the calendar now. We've also got a poll online. If you do want to have a vote, skysports.com, would you like to see reverse grid races <laughs> at some Grand Prix in the future? You can have your say right now, in fact, and let's see what those latest figures are. Um, so this calendar is out. We will be in Austria. The first race will be on Sunday, July the 5th. There'll be another race in Austria on July the 12th. Then it's on to Hungary for July the 19th. Then it's back to the UK. Silverstone, the first race is August the 2nd. The second race is on the 9th. And then it's straight to Spain for a third race in that block on the 16th before uh, a week, in, week or two in the UK before we're in Spa on the 30th of August and Monza on September the 6th. Martin, putting them in your diary, did it give you a, a good feeling this morning? It did, actually. Uh, yeah, I changed, I changed my calendar certainly up until September. I was a bit shocked, if I'm honest, because you look at it and think, yeah, at the time where we've got to go from one to the other in a, in a some kind of biosphere, I believe it's called, some kind of bubble, and then if we do have to quarantine anywhere, whatever, but, so it's going to be full on, um, but I'm not complaining because we've had several weeks with, uh, or months with no uh, Formula One, so I'm very excited about it, but they're going to be coming thick and fast when they happen, and, it, and it's, I think it's going to be thrilling. I think it's going to be very challenging for the teams logistically with parts, especially with the accident damage and that, you know, once we get on the road, 
we're we're just going for it and um it, it, i mean we could end up the way that these countries are opening up left right and center every day we could be, look a bit bizarre in our biosphere um and the way we're going to be operating within a grown free environment but if that's how we have to get it signed off and how the drivers will accept being there and us all being you know some of us being around then so be it so fundamentally yes i mean really excited and they're going to come thick and fast and and for the drivers i mean that is a, a quite a routine to get into you've got three races every week weekend we know that usually with a back-to-back they take monday off to rest and then get going again and train again and stuff it's quite a relentless calendar oh don't feel too sorry for the drivers <laughs> race they, they, they get the best treatment out of anyone i can tell you it's much harder doing this job than being a driver <laughs> no, i'm joking um you know it is strenuous of course but the the worst thing for the driver is, is the mental stress. Um, it is a head game, definitely. Um, you know, when you're racing against uh, drivers of equal ability, it, it comes down to the strength in, in the head. So, um, you know, that's going to maybe take its toll in such a short injection of time to be racing one week after the other. Um, that's the thing that they're going to have to be careful of, not to burn themselves out um, after having such a long time thinking about it. Um, then actually getting on the road and doing it is another thing. So the, the, I think the biggest challenge for everyone will be jumping in that car for the first time and getting out there in Austria and charging up that hill out of the pit lane down towards turn three. Uh, I think the first time they go through a series of higher speed corners and feel that G-force again, I think it's going to be an absolute shock to the system. Um, they've hardly been driving road cars, let alone... Uh, Formula One cars during these last 10, 11, 12 weeks. And speaking to a couple of drivers that were out testing, I believe yesterday, some GT drivers at Silverstone, they were saying it was a total shock to the body. Um, they've been playing all their simulation games and everything, you know, trying to keep their, their hand in, their eye coordination the best they can, but to actually experience G-Force again uh, was, was a real shock. So... I, I can see a lot. I mean, it's a tricky circuit as well, Austria. We see at the best of times drivers going off there, damaging the car, the wings and the suspension on those really harsh curbs. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of mistakes. And um, yeah, in the wheel to wheel action as well. Super rusty drivers, I think. It, it, could, be, uh, it could be quite exciting. Maybe we Rage. don't need anything else to spice up the two weekends, that's for sure. Also, I think um, Lando, Norris and Alex Albon have been out in some F3 cars uh, either today or this week. And the Williams guys, George and Nicholas, are getting in, into old Renault World Series cars as well. Just, for you, as you say, to get a feel for what it's actually like driving again. But Craig, um, we heard from Chase Carey about quarantine and about what it's going to be like at races. Can you expand on that a bit for us? And also, I understand there's an 80 to 90 page document <laughs> that is going to be telling us what we are and aren't allowed to do. Yes, well... Unfortunately for me, I won't be going to Austria, but I wish everyone well who is going there. I wish I was going there, I hasten to add. Uh, I think we have to doff our caps a little bit uh, to Chase Carey. It wasn't so long ago he was standing in Australia having to tell the world that the Grand Prix was off. And at that point, you doubted when an F1 season was going to start. Uh, whether Silverstone would be part of it was in doubt until early last week, I would say, when consistent pressure uh, well-reasoned arguments by Formula One, by Chase and the rest of his team, and by Silverstone as well, explaining the benefits to the UK economy of that race, which, which flies the flag uh, for the excellence, which is British motorsport and its attendant industries. 85% of the performance car engineers are based in this country, 40,000 jobs. Uh, but unless we had that exemption to the 14-day quarantine for people coming into this country, Silverstone would not have been able to happen. Uh, people asking why celebrity racing drivers and footballers uh, are getting this kind of exemption. Well, it is to support the wider industry that elite sport uh, is part of. But yes, it's going to be a bubble, as, as, as Martin says. But there's the determination to get on with things, which is absolutely vital. Chase Carey saying this week that even if a driver tests positive, the show will go on. Even if a team has to pull out, the event will have to continue. Uh, that's been backed up by Jean Tott, head of the FIA, and his medical chief, Professor Gerard Sayon, who told me uh, in a discussion that they're ready for perhaps 10 people to test positive at an event. Let's hope there aren't any, but he believes that it's conceivable that they could isolate, contain, treat uh, that kind of number 
and still allow a, a Grand Prix to go on. So detailed preparation, and hopefully that's going to enable the season not just to start but to continue. Um, also, I think just a couple of other points to get bring to you from that uh, Chase Carey interview. He's hoping to uh, finalise the remainder of the calendar by the end of this month. He's also um, said that, as you mentioned, Craig, in, in terms of a driver getting ill or getting the virus, then the reserve driver will come in. If it's anybody else in the paddock, they'll be quarantined in a hotel room. The event will continue. They're hoping to have limited capacity for some fans by the autumn, and they're work, trying to work out a way to do that. Um, the reverse grid, he did say, yes, I'm not keen to have gimmicks for the sake of it. Um, also, Stuart Pringle at Silverstone has said that it's too soon for reverse grid races. Not on his turf, he said. Not on my turf. <laughs> not it. on my patch. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, and also the Concord Agreement, uh, Chase said, was in the final stages when the virus hit. So it's essentially on hold as um, priorities have changed right now. Um, let's just um, move it on. I think, Craig, were there any other moments from that Toto presser that you sat in on earlier that you want to bring up that we were talking about today. I know he referenced as well Lewis's his comments and his and his rousing of the rest of the Formula One paddock as well to react to things that have been happening in America. Yes, strong, powerful words from Lewis Hamilton, not for the first time on an important subject. Uh, he's emerged as a real leader within Formula One. Uh, he was reflecting on the tragic events in America, the death of George Floyd. Uh, and he was questioning Formula One, why we hadn't heard from any of the, the major figures from within it, uh, questioning why the sport remains so white dominated uh, as well. Uh, to be fair from him, seven or eight drivers pretty quickly showed their support for Lewis. His Mercedes team said they stood right behind them. And in the news conference today, Toto Wolff again reflected on how he had learned personally from his own relationship with Lewis Hamilton. Uh, learned about the complexities of certain situations within society uh, and, and questioned how he can make a difference in terms of improving diversity in his own life and within the sport as well. Um, we talked about a number of factors which could maybe enable things to improve. One thing Toto was, 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 was quite uh, stressing as, as important is that it must be cheaper for, for talented young individuals to have a career in the junior formula, particularly karting, if, if the sport is to become more diverse, not just in racial terms, but perhaps in class terms as well, more people from ordinary backgrounds able to take part, uh, it must be easier to get into. It must be easier to be able to express your talent uh, and for maybe the, the driver programs are related to a point to then pick those individuals up. Prefer to Formula One, uh, just finally, they, they are working on, on programs. They, they have plans for a diversity program, uh, both within the engineering side of the sport and hopefully to, to provide a more diverse grid at some point in the, in the future as well. So they haven't been in charge, Liberty Media, for that long and they are doing something. But having had for so many years a personal opinion coached out of sportsmen I've interviewed by, by media officers and, and so on. It, it's refreshing to hear uh, this latest generation, not just Lewis, but the Orlando Norrises, your George Russells, uh, Max Verstappen, just have that little bit more personality uh, and, and confidence to express themselves. I'm not going to complain about that. Um, to wrap up, we have four weeks until we're going to be at a racetrack. Can you believe it? Or some people are going to be at a racetrack. Um, from you, Martin, what... How, how do the drivers spend that four weeks? What do they do now? We know some of them are trying to get out on track and Ant as well. I mean, <laughs> you've got four weeks, you're going to be racing. They've never experienced anything like this before. Well, driving a racing car is a bit like swimming or riding a bicycle. You don't forget how to do it. And sometimes you have a long layoff over the winter. And I've, I've even heard the great Michael Schumacher and other people say this and even, and even, over recent winters with the great drivers going, I hope we can still do this. You do have this slight bit of self-doubt when you get in the car. And as hard as you work in the gym, you can't replicate 5G under braking or through a corner with all of your internal organs moving around. You can work your muscles and your neck and, and keep yourself sharp and do the exercises they do for hand-to-eye coordination. But I agree with that. It'll be a shock. And I know what it's like when you first used to go out your first run of the year. Everything seems to flash past your eyes a little bit too fast. Yeah, Hockenheim and Monzi lift off the throttle. It was like, whoa, this is, this is all happening too quickly. But you very quickly dial into it. So the drivers will prepare in carts and cars and where they can in the gym. 
Um, I think it's dream ticket for, for most of them, if not all of them. Lots of racing. They're back up and running. It's what they were born to do. They don't have to, they're not going to uh, have to talk to a load of boring journalists like us. There might be a, we might be able to sneak in here and there. They're not going to have to sign too many autographs or do a lot of fan forum stuff. All they're going to do is drive their Formula One cars. Lucky boys. Yeah, and, and I can see the grin on your face. That, that appeals to you, definitely, if that's, that's all you had to do. I know you mentioned before that let me race Rusty. We could see incidents. We could see all sorts of stuff. Um, so, so, I mean, are you nervous before you get back in it or are you just desperate to get back in the car again? No, no, you're not nervous at all. Far from it. You're, you're really excited to, to get back in. I, I'm, I'm the same. You know, Le Mans is still on the calendar for me this year and I, I can't wait to get back in the car. But you do, as Martin was saying, you do know that that first outlap is going to be is going to be a, a real shock to the senses. And I can't remember which driver it was in the past. It was someone like Jimmy Clark. I remember my dad telling me um, that once he said, you know, the main thing you have to do is try and slow down time. And it's that's exactly the point. You know, like Martin saying, it's a blur when you first go out there. It's the the scenery is flashing by and you can't believe the speed of these cars that they drive. Um, you know, if you put anyone just from the street and just strap them in for one lap in qualifying, uh, I think you'd black out from pure shock. Um, but you know, you, you build that up as you go. And, uh, you know, it is in a way you're, you're slowing down time. It's amazing how your brain can do that, how it takes the information in through the eye and then, the way that you control the steering and the throttle and feel it, all your senses um, through those four contact patches of, of the tires on the ground and, uh, and your inner gyro as well that you have, like the fluid in your, in your inner ear that's getting obviously sloshed around from all the high G-force that you go through and expose the body to. It's, it's a pretty impressive machine. Out of all those cars on the grid, by far the most impressive machine is the human body. And, uh, you know, the way that it can adapt is incredible. But that first couple of laps, you know, it's, uh, it's not going to be quite in tune. And uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's the excitement. That's what gets the, the butterflies going in the, in the stomach, I guess, for some of them. Well, Craig, we've talked about those eight races that have been confirmed. What can you tell us about the rest of the calendar, as you've heard? OK, uh, well, a uh, couple of important figures. Eight is one because you can crown a champion after eight races. We all know that. Uh, 15 is another important race for a number of contractual reasons. So that's another target for F1 to get to. At the end of the calendar, they do still think they've got this option of leeway by having two races potentially at either Bahrain or Abu Dhabi. So if they have to do that, 8 plus 4 equals 12. Then they're filling in the middle bit. They're pretty confident that both uh, Azerbaijan and Russia might take place. That's what I'm hearing. We should get some news this week one way or the other on the Singapore Grand Prix. Uh, if that does happen, it will probably be with some kind of proportion of fans there uh, because it's a city street race. Singapore is still deciding on, on how it's coming out of lockdown, but uh, there's a good chance that that will happen with some fans. The governor of Texas uh, has said that events with one quarter capacity can take place. Uh, I've been in touch with Cota. They're still evaluating that. Uh, but that's another potentially positive sign that we could get a Grand Prix there. Canada is still keen. Brazil have said this week they expect they can have the race with fans there. Uh, I think Formula One will want to take a look at that and the feasibility of that, given how badly that country has been hit. But, yeah, I think there's, a, there's certainly a, a decent prospect. I think, as, as Toto in his news conference, uh, and to Martin as well, said today, that you can get somewhere around the mid to high teens of Grand Prix this year, which would be a decent season. Definitely, definitely. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. We have uh, loads more for you still to watch before we go racing. In fact, uh, quiz part three is on tonight on Sky Sports F1 at 8pm, as well as on all our digital platforms. And we have a watch along of that incredible race in Brazil at Interlagos with Carlos Sainz and Pierre Gasly. That's on at nine o'clock on Sky Sports F1 and all our digital platforms. Gentlemen, lovely to see you today and I will see you very soon and hopefully some of us will be in Austria in a month's time. Thanks for your company today. Thanks Rachel. Thank you, Thank you for watching. Stay, stay safe and we will hopefully see you somewhere very soon.